Our next uh, reader is Moniza Alvey from her wonderful book, At the Time of Partition. And uh, I've read Moniza's poems for years, and for me her poetry's always had a global kind of reach, but not in any kind of hackneyed way, but because she makes me aware when I read her work of other Englishes, other languages, other poetries, other histories, and how they can feed into my writing and my reading and my life. And this collection is a personal reaction to the partition of India and Pakistan in 1947. And it gives us a poet's way of looking at history, working it through imagination and making it fluid, making the content and the long form mesh brilliantly. And the community artist in me wants everybody to have a go at something like this. Not that it's easy, but what a transforming way this is of looking at history. And when things happen like a couple of weeks ago, when the cabinet papers get released, and it turns out that 30 years ago they were lying about how many pits they were going to shut, you think you can't leave politicians in charge of history. So who do we leave in charge of history? I think we leave points, like Moniz or Alvi. Moniz. Hello from me. Yes, uh, History Indeed, The Partition of India. Excerpts from a single poem inspired by my widowed grandmother's flight with her children to the newly created Pakistan. Her eldest son, Atta, a young man who'd suffered brain damage as a child, disappeared at that time, never to be seen again the fate of many. The decision to leave, Atta is entrusted to friends. Ever after, she heard it as an echo in her inner ear, disembodied as in a sense all voices are. We'll take him, Shakira, he can travel with us. You've enough on your hands with the other four. There are places still on the second bus, inshallah. At that swollen moment, there was a shadowy unburdening because at that time, perhaps any child was a burden. How she would wish as the weeks and the months and the lifetimes churned on to undo, take him, to force back the heavy, rusted hands of the clock. God's clock held by God's hands in permanent view. Say your goodbyes, tick the clock. No time to lose. But who was left for goodbyes? Her Hindu friends, the friends of friends, a stream drying up. How to say it? Tomorrow we will be gone. It was hard to sit on a cane-seated chair on her old veranda and sip tea, the conversation curdling. Tomorrow we will be gone. The risk of departing and the risk of remaining weighing much the same. My grandmother and four of her children go by bus to Pakistan. And Atta, they inquired, where is he? He's with... She explained it as best she could and peered through the grainy glass. Where will you live? Have you any arrangements? An arrangement? It lay breathing at the end of the tunnel, hopped towards her like a tamed bird, like a kite it tangled in the trees. How much further? asked the children. How much further? the adults asked of themselves. Ludihana to Lahore, not so very far, but in partition time. At this point, the back of the story begins to break. Can it walk at all or hobble with a stick? Will it close its eyes and drift into sleep? How to serve it well? A whole landscape to traverse and a modest page. 
The night has half smothered its herons and geese, its vipers and cobras, its gently sloping plain, its rifles and swords, but it cannot smother its stories. The fruit vendor's tale, the farmer's tale, the dark's own tales, a train packed with the dead and no young women among them, two sacks on board filled not with the curves of mangoes and melons, but with women's breasts, and that which should also never be known, how, after decapitation, the hands will jerk upwards above the stump of the neck, have their last say, those tales which had no beginnings or had swallowed their endings, tales which recoiled from or feasted on themselves. Who could rival the tales of the dark like Scheherazade with no enchantment, no genie? How to arrive at one overarching story? A baby was born in transit. A stranger took a small dagger from his belt and cut the cord just like that. Don't leave the bus, parents warn their children. Better the airless bus were the world entire. My grandmother looks for her lost son in her mind's eye. In God's name, where was he? Amma, can we go and look? Amma climbed ridges, trailed a foot along a valley floor, laid the flat of her hand on a plane. Her mind's eye was a torch to beam through the intricate darkness of a tailor's workshop, the hanging, reeking bloodiness of a butcher's stall, the forgotten corners of a woodcarver's yard. She glimpsed his face from a great height, from alongside, from underneath, find him squatting at the back of a textile factory. In an instant, he'd be gone. India was behind her, as if somehow she'd outpaced it. She had to turn around to see it unroll or to watch it rise up like a single mountain. With a shake of her head, she tried to clear a street, sweep away the barriers to seeing where he was. Could anyone look as long and as hard as she did? Not me with my writing eye, not in any crush of a bazaar or wayside inn, cranny, cleft in a rock, not with any muscle of the imagination. Utta is still missing. The family is eventually rehoused in Lahore, a house vacated um, by a Hindu or Sikh family who would have made the crossing in the other direction. Brother, brother in England, sister, 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 mother, the family began to reconfigure around an absence, the ripeness of his loss, right as if some fruit must fall, but hour by hour, month by month, no fruit fell. No fruit, but the offer of a house, or part of one, not like for like, the building shared, no veranda, no garden with hibiscus in a border, no almond trees. A house neither old nor new, tucked away behind the bazaar, leaning into a yellow courtyard, its entrance on a narrow lane. Amma, this will do. Acha, acha. Yes, this will do. They moved like trespassers through the rooms of orphaned furniture, claimed chests of drawers, the shelves of the Almiras, removed saris and underskirts, sleeveless pullovers, shirts, chauvars, and replace them with their own. Tried all the beds, were they softer, harder? Inspected the kitchen, the bags of lentils, flour, opened and unopened, the tover in place on the stove, waiting for the moons of roti. And they noted in the darkened living room the number and position of chairs. 
everything as it was when a family mirroring their own had grasped the future and fled. And finally, I cross over as they couldn't the line of partition so arbitrarily drawn up by Sir Cyril Radcliffe, crossing back, the line between birth and non-being, the line between what happened and the imagining, a line so delicate a sparrow might have picked it up in its beak, a line of writing, a line so definite and so blurred. Time to return the unending story to itself. Time to return everyone to themselves. Time to cross swiftly back over the line. Thank you.